probably don't hear a message like that very often in church anymore. It's sad to say. And as I was saying this morning, this, this morning we talked about what? Christian perfection. The idea that there can be such thing as a perfect Christian. Um, that being said, what a perfect Christian is is somebody who loves God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength and loves their neighbor as himself. Tonight, we're going to talk about what a perfect Christian is not. <laughs> is not. Which is going to be fun, I think. Um, we'll get to laugh at one another, I hope. Uh, this should cause everybody to walk out of here a little bit lighter. Um, before I read the text, and this isn't in my notes, I think uh, one of the, the, the major reasons a sermon like this is, is needed in this day and age is... Christianity can seem like it's such a high standard that nobody can attain it. And we need to understand that God's standard is the one He set in place. And that's the standard we got to preach. And if we go above that standard, we're doing just as much damage to the gospel than preaching below it. We've got to be right in the middle of it. It's a hard thing so to balance that as a preacher sometimes because, you know, for many reasons. We're not going into that. But tonight... The title of this sermon is very uh, pertinent to something we say today all the time. We are only human. We are only human. Let's keep that in mind. Heavenly Father, we thank you that in our lostness and in our infirmities and in our lack of knowledge and wisdom, there's so many things, Lord, day to day in all of our lives that you overlook and keep us solid in victory. With no rebellion in our heart, Lord, sometimes we make mistakes. And sometimes, um, sometimes our humanity just gets in the way of, uh, of things. But Lord, you look over that. You're, you, tonight, we're going to see very clearly, are a redeemer. You are somebody who takes things, works all things together for the good, and those who love God are called according to your purpose. Tonight, Lord, let us see clearly that the blood of Jesus running off the, from, off the cross of Calvary, Lord, is sufficient not only to save us from sin, Lord, but allow you to overlook things in our life when we have a lack of wisdom and knowledge. We thank you, Lord, for the full spectrum of your saving grace. And it's in Jesus' precious and holy name that we pray. Some of you may even be a little uncomfortable by how I just prayed this thing because it sounds an awful lot like the kind of thing we wouldn't agree with around here. But there is some truth to that. There is some truth to that. We're gonna <clears throat> we're gonna get into this. We're gonna go right into it. First Corinthians chapter seven, beginning in verse one. Now, now concerning the things which you uh, never mind. Second Corinthians. See what I'm talking about. We all make mistakes. You say, I know that we're not talking about sexual immorality. Okay. And Bill, what's that at? Second Corinthians. It's right after First Corinthians, and right before my mind slipped my mind right now. Galatians. So it's uh, past Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, First Corinthians, Second Corinthians. Right. Okay. Good. Yeah. I have one cup of coffee at 5 o'clock. I'm required. I don't know if anybody else knows that. I don't. I'm going to have to settle myself down just a little bit. Huh? Yeah. That would be a good idea. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Let us do This is so funny because it's exactly what we're talking about. Well, that's not it either. Second Corinthians. We're getting there. Let's well, see, this is exactly what we're talking about. This is exactly what we're talking about. And I knew we wouldn't leave out of here without somebody laughing at somebody. 
I put my panel to work over here. So you can oh, so that's, that's what it is. I knew that seven in it somewhere. All right, 2 Corinthians 4, 7. See? Here we go. This is exactly where we're at. Oh, we're first finished. I said we won't do well. Okay. But we have this treasure. This is where we're at. Second Corinthians, and everybody should have had time to get there by now. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. That the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. What Paul was talking about is that there is there's a positive and a negative side to what I'm about ready to discuss here. And what Paul was talking about here was that although... We have a treasure, and it's a mighty treasure. It's a powerful treasure. It's God's kind of treasure. The Holy Spirit living in us, dwelling in us, the creative power of God living in our heart, in the core of our being, controlling us and guiding us and directing us and giving us wisdom and light and, and just glory in our life. But that treasure may be in us, and we are fragile people. We are fragile. An earthen vessel there means basically a clay pot. If anybody's ever had a clay pot, you know at least that one thing about a clay pot, they are pretty fragile. If you drop them, they're going to break. We're not going to go into graphic detail about what all that means. We're going to get right into what we're talking about tonight is this treasure that is in earthen vessels that we are, yes, recipients of the grace of God. We are, we have been born again of the Holy Spirit of God. We have been given victory as Christians over sin in our life that we can lead the sin life. And then further, God's grace can come and purify our hearts and cleanse us and perfect our hearts toward God and cause us to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as ourselves. But oftentimes, we focus on all of that but we get a lot of confusion in the area of this earthen vessel, of our humanity. That even though all those things are true, we are still human beings. Let me ask you a question. What if you could sin all you want and still go to heaven? Could you imagine a gospel like that? You could sin all you want and still go to heaven. After all, are we not always going to be sinful because of our flesh? Are we all just going to be sinful human beings? Are we just always going to be sinful? Matter, you know, I live in the flesh here. Look at my skin. Look at my bones. I mean, I was born into sin. I can't help it. I'm always going to sin. Of course, my, my Bible panel over here is already my mouth. <laughs> no. That's not the gospel. And I'll tell you what it was. It was one of the first major false teachings that the church had to deal with. It's one of the first major false teachings. One of the, one of the first things that the church had to deal with, and we're talking about the apostles, John, Paul. I mean, they were dealing with this thing of Gnosticism that was getting into the church culture that was basically saying that your flesh, literally, the skin on your body is sinful. Like, that is sinful. There's nothing you can do about it. You're always going to live in sin. Your spirit is clean, yes. You are figuratively clean, yes. You're, you are, God looks at you as clean, but your flesh is sinful. Literally, your skin and bones is sinful. This is what they taught. And there's another heresy that sprung up after that called antinomianism that basically taught that the law was of no use and men will always sin every day in thought, word, and deed. 
Now let me tell you, what's scary is that's a common teaching today. And one of the things that I noticed about understanding and learning what the Bible teaches is there are just a few things, and this is what I'm going to teach you, not one of those, that will just clear up those issues and bridge the gap in between even denominational boundaries. This is just one of them. <clears throat> a lot of people trace what they teach in their churches back to a man that was around, uh, that was alive around 300 A.D. named Augustine. You all probably heard of that name before. Maybe you haven't. His name's not important. What he taught was he his his ideas that what he thought the Bible said still influenced what a lot of people teach today. He wrote a thing. His most famous work was probably his Confessions. They study those those things even like philosophy classes and things in colleges. His Confessions were probably one of his most important works. And what Augustine said in his Confessions. This is taken from Book 10. Obviously, he had a lot of confessions. So this is taken out of Book 10 of his confessions. It said, he said, the human nature is irrevocably bad. Irrevocably bad. Right on the onset, what are we seeing here? That the human nature itself cannot be redeemed. It is irrevocable. It is just so bad, there's nothing you can do about it. So he was saying, the human nature is irrevocably bad. Not even the Calvary work of the Son of God can liberate it from the corruption in life. Whoa! Major, major statement there. A bad dream. Now this is where this goes. It's inevitable. A bad dream is an indication of a bad heart. Pleasure in taking food is sinful. Even the love of music is wrong. Now, I'm going to tell you something. That's not Christianity. That's shooting far above what God has laid upon us. And at the same time, and in the same few sentences, is coming far below what God did on Calvary. It's amazing how He can do that in just a few sentences. First of all, let me tell you some good news. There's nothing in your human sinful nature that cannot be redeemed by the grace of God. When somebody says that not even the Calvary work of the Son of God can liberate it from the corruption in life, what, what are they saying there? In a nutshell, that God's grace is not more powerful than sin. Or that sin is more powerful than God's power. That's the problem for me. It should be a problem for anybody who loves the Lord. But, most, and I'm, and I'm, you're saying most people? I'm saying most, yes, most people believe the same way Augustine believes today. You hear it come out like this. Well, I sin every day if I were to do. I'm a human being. I'm always going to sin. It's Augustine theology. That's what that is. That is his way of interpreting the Bible. This came around 300 AD. And for the last 1,700 years, the church has been, in some areas, it could be almost irrevocably Irrevocably. I mean, I don't know that you can turn it around in some areas. People believe it so strongly today. And what does that do? It gives you an excuse to say that I don't have any personal responsibility. I'm always going to sin, so I'm just going to kind of lay back and, and just take life as it comes and just hopefully I get to go to heaven one day. Well, that's really no Christian life to live. We must establish a difference between a physical flesh and a spiritual flesh. And we're going to go into that just a little bit tonight. But there's two types of sin in the Bible. Two prim just primarily, we'll go over this very quickly. There's sins that you commit, then there's a nature of sin in your heart. And God's grace takes care of all of that. Praise the Lord. This whole message, though, is to try to help you to move past like, okay, well, God's taking care of the sin in my heart. He can take care of the sin nature. But what about some of this other stuff? Is it sin or is it? I mean, what's going on here? I just don't seem to have the victory I thought I was going to have in this area. Some of these victories have to come by just understanding, knowledge, wisdom. That's, you know, that's how you have to overcome some of these things. There's no way around it, really. This whole message is to help you gain understanding about some of the things that the devil, the enemy of your souls, is going to give you false, 
guilt and wrong thinking and it's going to try to slow down your growth in the Lord because you're sitting there coming to altars every single service trying to overcome something that God's grace does not overcome. It's something that you just have to get some knowledge and wisdom on. And we're going to go into that. This may sound crazy. This may sound weird and different. But we're going to go into this a little bit tonight. We must understand the people. As people, we can have victory over all sin in this life. But this does not mean that we're going to have victory over every misjudgment, every mishap, and every mistake, and so on and so forth. We are definitely liable to make errors in our life. In that way, I can accept that we are human beings. We're liable to make errors. We're not going to know it all. With the help of the devil, Adam and Eve brought the fall of man upon us. When this took place, death and overall wrong in general just entered into God's perfect creation. And when it entered into perfect create, God's perfect creation, not only did things begin to die, physical deaths, but things in our nature began to be marred. Our mind, for instance. Anybody have memory problems? I do. Where do you think that came from? It was a consequence of the sin nature, but when you forget something, that doesn't mean it's a sin. You know, it's just things like that that people don't, it's just little minute things like that. People don't understand. And, I, and I'll tell you something, like, how many marriages have been affected because somebody forgot a certain date of something? Or something like that. And then people are like, you know, listen, we're human beings. We're bound to forget something. And the more I have on my plate, the more I'm going to forget. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Just as a general introduction. While all sin, whether it is sinful actions or sinful natures, nature, it it must, or while all sin, whether it is sinful action or a sinful nature, is dealt with through the blood of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. I've already said this, we're just going to reiterate it though. Infirmities are dealt with through a proper understanding of God's mercy and grace with the wisdom that is in His Word. You've got to learn, in other words, how to cope with some of the things in your life. And God's grace is there to cope with that. Praise God. So in order to maintain our victory as Christians, and as even sanctified Christians, and grow in grace, we must understand the difference between sin and infirmities. And even though it's isn't written in my notes, I think this is extremely important. It's extremely important because Satan loves, one of his greatest strategies is to get you so focused on your shortcomings that you can't see what's going on around you. Then you can't grow in God's grace and you can't get your eyes upon Jesus because he's got you focused on this thing that you're just searching so hard for victory over and, and God's grace is just not there for that. That's all. God's grace takes care of the sin issue. But God's grace is not available for just their basic human makeup. Now I'm not saying that that's a that's a concrete statement. I'm not saying that God's grace cannot help us with these things. But if we're talking about cleansing of sin versus cleansing of who we are as human beings. Those two things we have to make a distinction. One of our favorite verses in the holiness movement and personally for me is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verses 23 and 24. And trust me, those are the right verses. So you can trust me on that. You can turn to that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23 and 24. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 and 24 basically says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Everybody say, Amen. That's Amen. awesome. He wants to sanctify you completely. Whether tonight or maybe by your bed sometime this week, God wants to do a full work of grace in your heart. Does what? And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So not only does He want to sanctify you completely, He wants to sanctify you completely before Jesus comes back. He wants to do it right now, on this earth, before Jesus ever returns. He wants to sanctify you. And that's right. He wants to sanctify you. You don't do the sanctifying. God does the sanctifying. That's why 24 says, He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Now here's a common issue that happens when people get sanctified is when they get sanctified and God cleanses them from all sin, the standard of sanctification they have in their mind is so high that they do not understand 
that God that that some of the things that they're struggling with and dealing with is not part of the sanctification package. The sanctification package takes care of the sin nature, but it does not take care of some of the day-to-day -day things that they deal with. So we're going to look at these three areas tonight, spirit, soul, and body. And we're going to look at the things in each one of those things. You know, God <laughs> gives me the grace and the help to do it. This is kind of difficult. But if God gives me the grace and the help to do it, we're going to look at spirit. We're going to look at soul. We're going to look at body. We're going to look at each one of those things. And we're going to see what God's grace does. And to a bigger degree, what God's grace does not do. And I can promise you this, when you understand these things, hopefully we'll all feel walk out of here lighter. We'll all walk out of here saying, okay, I get this thing. And instead of looking for deliverance, you can start looking rightly toward coping and help. So let's look at this. Spirit. God wants to sanctify your spirit. If your spirit is not sanctified, He wants to do it. Okay. Now you're looking at me like... Okay, what does that mean? What is the Spirit? Okay, well, when you look up the Spirit and look at its Greek definition to make it really simple, the Spirit is essentially your will. He wants to sanctify your will, your willpower. He wants to sanctify that. A strong-willed child is what we would call a strong-spirited child. Right? Have you all ever heard that? I've heard that before. Strong-spirited child. He wants to sanctify your spirit, which is also... If your spirit is the seat of your will, sitting on that seat is going to be your convictions. He wants to sanctify your convictions. He wants to, he wants to take the things that you believe and make those things concrete. And He wants to make them holy. And that's what the will is. You know, He wants to make sure that the choices that you make are based upon solid, holy convictions so that you can get through life pleasing Him. That's a wonderful truth. That's a wonderful truth. But... There are certain infirmities, there are certain uh, things that are part of our human nature that can hinder those things. And this is where we get to laugh a little bit because you'll probably, you've probably seen these, especially if you're a Christian that's been doing this a while, a lot longer than I have, maybe some of you, you're going to look back and say, yeah, I can see that, I can see that, and as I did studying for this. Billy Yoko wrote his book, The Holy Way, a fantastic book. Uh, me and Billy got the pleasure of reading that in Holiness Theology, and David and Sarah had to do it. A great book, and it's simple. Um, so he said, <clears throat> these infirmities, these things of our human nature that can hinder our will, are things like an unpleasing personality. You realize that we are all we all have personalities. You guys get that? Have you ever been around somebody that has a personality that just don't line up with yours? You just have a hard time with them. It doesn't make their personality necessarily sinful. They just have a personality that's different than yours. Guess what? God's grace is there to help you get over it. And love them anyway. <laughs> and deal with them anyway. <clears throat> what about some other things? How about, and I've suffered from this one, the slowness of your mental processes. And sometimes you just come to things in a slower way. The things that sometimes you realize something is a sin well after you committed the sin. You just didn't understand at that time. God don't hold that against you. He gives you wisdom and knowledge and you just move past it. It's not a sin, for instance, to have a poor memory. Thank God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You all seen that in me already tonight. It is not a sin to have a poor memory. Sometimes if you came from a background like me where you've taken a whole lot of drugs in your life and alcohol and all this stuff, your memory is just tight sometimes. It just doesn't, it's just not a help. It's more of a hindrance to you in your personal life. And so when you try to do things like I do, you know, and I'm in college and I'm memorizing all kinds of Bible verses and stuff all the time, I just tell you, I don't do good on my Bible verses sometimes. I try to memorize those things. Especially if they're like, a verse from the Old Testament that's six sentences long or something. You know, I'm trying to memorize all that. Does that make me any less of a child of God? Does that make me any less holy? But I'm going to tell you something. What Satan will try to do with something like this is he's going to see, say, see, you're not completed in the grace of God. See, you're not all you could be in God because you, you're deficient. You can't do it. But God said he's not trying to call 
strong people to go out and just, you know, memorize the whole Bible and just evangelize the world. He's saying, I'm calling weak people so that I can empower them, give them grace, help them, use the weak things to confound the wise. How many of you tonight have ever just judged something the wrong way? I have, yeah. You just judged the situation and it was, you just made a wrong judgment. But you still followed through with that wrong judgment, didn't you? And then there was some sort of bad outcome to it and you had to cope with that. It doesn't make it a, necessarily a sin. It makes it a mistake. You know, if you were going with the best that you had, there wasn't any ill will in your heart. That goes right along with ignorance, prejudice, biased judgments. I mean, people have pre people have prejudices about this church. That doesn't make their sin their their prejudices necessarily sinful. They're just looking at us and saying, you know what? They're part of this holiness bunch. This holiness bunch is like this, and they're just weird and strange, and I'm not going to go there. It doesn't make what their opinion sinful at all. Uh, it just that's their judgment. And I guarantee if they ever came here, they'd probably change their mind. Probably change their mind. These things, we just don't think about this stuff very much, do we? How these things can hinder our will, can hinder our, our convictions, and can hinder, and when we, what we need to do is be diligent, like when we take something like a, like a biased judgment, we need to be diligent that if we're going to make a judgment about something, we need to study it out and figure it out and make sure that our judgment is based upon wisdom and not our opinion. Because guess what? We're human. We make bad judgments sometimes. It's good to go to the source. It's good to have wisdom on these things. Strong-willed people, like me, can be contentious from time to time, can't they? Know? They can be contentious. They can be very contentious. Now, if you want to see something, you want to see this played out in the Bible, you can turn to Acts. You can turn into Acts and look at what Paul said here. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take them, take with them John called Mark. Has anybody else read anything by John Mark? The book of Mark. The book of Mark. <laughs> He's, he was a gospel writer. He's actually... Uh, the main witness for Peter. Peter spoke to Mark and he wrote all that out. Mark was, in other words, a big deal in the early church. But Paul, whenever Barnabas wanted to take Mark along, Paul insisted that they should not take with him the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia. So what John Mark had did is he had deserted Paul and Barnabas. And Paul was basically saying to Barnabas, why are you bringing this guy along? He's a deserter. Well, Barnabas was the guy that was discipling Paul. He was a ministry partner of Paul. And so then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. They departed from one another. They, they left one another. This is like a sad day in the church. You know, a lot of people are hard on Paul in that, in that moment. But I'm going to submit to you, I'm not sure that Paul actually committed a sin there. I don't think he really committed a sin there. I think Paul had a legitimate reason. I would to, I mean, these guys are putting their life on the line. I mean, you read about Paul's testimony. The guy was stoned. He was shipwrecked. He was, I mean, he died once or once or twice. He died twice, didn't he? I think. And, you know, he's like, this wasn't just like they were going and, and hanging out in church. These people were literally putting themselves out there in the city to city being persecuted by crazy. And Paul was trying to make the case listen. We don't need weaklings along with us in this. Why would you bring this guy along? He's already ran off once. Why would you bring him back? Seriously, Barnabas? But Barnabas insisted because his personality was a little bit different than Paul's. That Barnabas had a personality kind of like, kind of like John. Like John, I always thought of you as having that Barnabas personality. He's just always encouraging, always loving, always gentle, always great balance for me because he's always, I'll be like, and then John will be like, well, you ought to think about it. You know? Like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you know, that, it's always been a help in my faith. And, like, you got to have those kind of people. But 
I don't mean that John and I, we've known each other, he's known each other. I'll use John as an example. He's known me since the day I was saved. Like two, two or three we out before. So we've known each other a long time. And it's good to have people like that around. You know, because you're surrounding yourself all the time with people that agree with you. Um, you're probably not going to get much done. <laughs> it's just true. But, you know, even though John and I have vastly different personalities, we're like best friends because, you know, we... We don't let that get in between us. You know? Barnabas had this really kind, loving, gentle, encouraging personality. Paul had this let's get things done kind of personality. And when those two things clash, they had this, this irreconcilable difference. They're like, well, we're just going to go over separate ways this morning. I don't think that necessarily, and I am saying I don't think. I'm not saying I'm no perfectly, but I've heard people try to say, well, see, Paul sinned here. I don't think this is a sin as much as it was a personality difference. And see, we have to be able to see those kind of things because people will take a verse like this and say, like, see, Paul's a sinner. He's a sinner, just like us. You know? But what you're seeing here is two different personalities. So they went two different places. Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, Scripture says, and Paul chose Silas and departed, being Commended by the brethren to the grace of God. I mean, even after that moment, they were commended to go out and they went through Syria and Cilicia and strengthening the churches. So you've got to ask yourself the question is it wrong to be strong willed? Is it wrong to be strong willed? I will tell you the struggle for somebody who is strong willed is that you're constantly wondering whether or not that you're truly coming. I'll just be honest with you. That is one of my struggles. It's been my struggle since early in my faith. Am I really humble? Because I am strong willed. And I'm, I'm just one of those go get it kind of attitudes. Well, you can be humble and still be strong willed. It's not a sin to be strong willed. That's just how you're made. That's just who you are. Some people are just, they have this leadership kind of personality. And it's usually those people that have a leadership, strong willed type personality that have to learn how to lead, it's, I feel like it's even harder sometimes. Because you have this tendency to just want to do everything yourself all the time. And it's not healthy. I believe tonight, God uses strong-willed people. He can sanctify that strong will and use it to His glory. But you cannot give yourself over to pride and think you've got everything figured out either. This is a perfect example that God does not give perfect knowledge when you're sanctified. This does not give perfect knowledge. We'll go into that here in just a second, though. It is good to be determined. It is bad to be a know-it-all. <laughs> it is good to be determined. It is bad to be a know-it-all. We must keep ourselves in check and approach things with understanding always. Let God sanctify our spirit. And let us also gain understanding and grow in that sanctification. The second thing you see here in 1 Thessalonians, he sanctifies us our whole spirit and our whole soul. According to Thayer's Greek lexicon, the soul here represents the seat of our emotions. This is extremely important today because our culture, my age, Dustin's age, Leah's age, Gloria's age, and that, that group of people, especially David and Sarah's age, that, that generation make so many decisions based on emotions. And that's so destructive. That's so destructive. The soul is the seat of our feelings, our desires, our affections, and our aversions. This is the source of what we would call our passion for life. This is our passion for life, you know. But I'm going to tell you something. Passion only takes you so far. Passion might get you to where you're going, but it's not going to keep you there. What happens when the passion goes away? You've got to, you've got to reconcile these things with grace of God. Grace of God. You've got to look into these things. The ways in which our humanity can get in the way of our soul are things like limited spiritual insight, the tendency to uh, allow love to uh, obscure our wisdom. This one I've said a whole, whole lot. I was really surprised to find it in this uh, book by Dale Yoakum. He said the same thing. Zeal without wisdom. Anybody ever seen that before? That's an ugly thing. I'll just tell you, looking back at my life, I had a ton of zeal, 
no wisdom. Boy, I made some stupid mistakes. <laughs> Boy, I made some stupid mistakes because I let my emotions drive my thinking. Well, you've got to be able to separate your soul from your spirit. You've got to be able to separate your emotions from your will because your emotions can lead you astray. Ask every single drug addict I've ever met in my life, including myself. Emotions driven. It's just emotions driven. I've just got to get through the day. I've got to feel something good. I've got to feel happy. So I'm going to drink a beer. Whatever, you know. It's emotions driven. <clears throat> we are an emotions driven group of people in our age. Here's another one. Kindness. Acting in the best interest of others. Again, driven by emotions. But this kind of thing driven by emotions is what causes parents to enable their children's drug addiction. It's emotions driven. It's emotions driven. <clears throat> and most importantly, I think, to talk about is grief and sorrow. Grief and sorrow. We're going to go get a little bit deeper into this. So is it wrong to be in passion? No. But misplaced passion, can, well, I'm not going to say can lead you astray. Misplaced passion always leads you. It's going to put you over here somewhere. You've got to make sure those passions are sanctified. What, if, what am I passionate about today? I am, I have got passion for people to hear the gospel. Further, I've got passion for people to be discipled. I have passion to see people grow in grace and have passion even in this sermon. My passion is coming out because I know that if you listen to what I'm saying and really take it to heart, You'll walk out of here in a lot of unrealized freedom. And that's really what I want, is people to walk in freedom. What was my passion before? To play filthy music on the drums. I had a passion for it. I mean, I was passionate. I was so passionate. I took one of the filthiest bands in the world and learned every single song they had on the drums. It was my passions that drove me. I had, I had just a passion to make just as much money as I could sell drums. My passions grow with that. You know? You have to have those passions sanctified by the grace of God. You're going to have passion. You're going to have emotion. You're never not going to have that. Matter of fact, Paul said, he mentioned in, in I believe it was in Ephesians, how the people, that he, des he described depraved people as people that are being past feeling. You're going to have passions. You're going to have emotions. On the other side of that, you're going to have grief and sorrow. You're going to have grief and sorrow. And it don't make you any less sanctified to have grief and sorrow. You're going to be sad over a loved one. You're going to be sad when somebody persecutes you. You're going to be sad whenever something happens to you. It's going to cause your heart to flutter. It's going to happen. And to not react to those emotions makes you less than human. That's what Paul was trying to say. There. Don't suppress that. Find a way to vent that in a sanctified way. Best way is prayer, for instance. Let your passions drive you to prayer. Don't let your passions drive you over here to something that's only going to get you through for a little bit. Let your passions drive you to prayer, for instance. Emotionally, you see this all the time. People try to fill voids that only God can fill. For instance, somebody getting married. For instance, because they an evangelist hit on this up here uh, not too long ago, just this last week. People, in, especially in college age kids, they feel like they just have to get married. They have to have a boyfriend. They have to have a girlfriend. That God can't fill that void. And this is not true. Matter of fact, what you're doing there is you're putting something before God. God wants to fill that void. What do we call whenever we meet our, our future husband, future wife, boyfriend, girlfriend? You know, wherever you are in your walk of life today, what do we say? I have fell in love with this person. Right? I have fell in love with this person. And I thought Pastor Jared made a very good point. It's as if you had no choice in the matter whatsoever. You just fell for this person. Oh, they entered the room and I just fell for this person. Well, what happens if you fall in love with that person, Christians, and they're not saved? What, what's happened there? What happened? Are you going to start dating them? Because that's a sin. The Bible says that very plainly. Now we're treading off the ice, don't we? 
Now we're treading on. We're getting close to home. Oh, but I felt old, but I'm just so in love with that person. No, love has very little to do with emotions. Anybody that's been married any amount of time will tell you that, I get. <laughs> marriage needs to be put, this is not the most, but I think marriage needs to be put back into the spirit. It needs to be put back into the choice of the will. That's, that's where marriage really has victory. If marriage is solely based on emotions, it's nothing. Period. What I'm trying to say here is we have a choice in the matter. Just because you feel something doesn't mean that you have to do it. But see, that feeling is part of your humanity. And so you've got to learn how to ignore that. Because you feel something does not necessarily make it sinful. Okay. So let's see how this applies. How many people have ever heard of the seven deadly sins? You ever heard of that? Seven deadly sins. I think there's even been movies made about that. It seems like I remember that. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16. It's where you find this, by the way. If anybody's ever wanted to find that in the Bible, that's where they're at. <clears throat> when you turn there, and I will, just to be sure we're on track here. Repeat that here. Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 16. Beginning at verse 16. I'm just going to read these really quickly. We're going to look through them. These six things the Lord hates. That's strong words, isn't it? That's what makes them say the deadly sins. Yet six things the Lord, these six things the Lord hates, yet, yes, I'm sorry, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness. Who also speaks who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren, or basically like turns two people against each other, talking about you know each other behind the back. Those things God hates. I mean, that's strong, strong. Like God hates those things. Like those are just abominations. To him. You might as well just you know, just do whatever. I mean, God, you know, He just does not like those things. Well, let's look at those things just for a second. We'll look through each one of them. There is a human quality to these things that has been perverted to cause them to go into that sort of sin. They all begin with something that is not sinful, in other words, and they climax into this horrendous sin. For instance, proud look. Proud look. Can anybody think of anything? And I'm just going to ask a few questions. Feel free to answer them. Can anybody think of anything in our culture that people could get a proud look about, or how somebody would have a how, how somebody would have a proud look? What's an example of a proud look? What's that? Uh huh. Proud look. I think of an athlete with a poor attitude. Athlete with a poor attitude. You have an opinion on David? I'm going to be interested to hear it. About material possessions or about the way we present ourselves in dress. Okay, how we present ourselves, material possessions, what David said. Why do you think somebody would have a proud look? And I'm just going to go ahead and tell you. A lot of times, they're trying to overcompensate for something that's going on in their life. Overcompensate for something that's going on in their life. In other words, there's some sort of deep hurt that has deeply hurt their self-esteem, and they are trying to overcompensate that by being something awesome. I'm awesome. That's a proud look. God does not like that. He looks down on that. So he's saying, but is a deep hurt sinful? Is having low self-esteem necessarily sinful? Is having a low self-image, like the way you look and view yourself, is that sinful? No. It's not. God's wanting to help you with that. That's not a sinful thing. But it can cause sin. See what I'm talking about? There's a difference between sinfulness and your common humanity. What about, why would somebody have a lying tongue? Somebody would have a lying tongue because they don't want to get caught. <laughs> they don't want to get caught. I mean, that's ours to it. There's this, this sense of, this fear of getting caught. But is a fear of, of, Consequences is necessarily a sin? No. It's not. But it can cause you to sin. Can you see the differences here? <clears throat> what about 
this one's kind of easy. I'll ask you all this one. What can cause shedding innocent blood? What can cause that? It wouldn't necessarily be a sin. Anger. But is anger a sin? It's not a sin. Isn't that free to think about that? Anger itself is not a sin. The Bible tells us to be angry and sin not. Acting out upon that anger can cause you to sin. Acting out of that anger can cause you to sin, but anger in itself is not sinful unless it turns to hatred, bitterness. That's when you've got a problem. I'm going to tell you something. I get angry when I think about there's a woman up in Louisville that slaughtered, I mean, thousands of babies in an abortion room. One, one doctor. <laughs> I mean, we're talking, oh, probably over 10,000 different babies have been killed. I'm angry with her. I am. That don't mean I hate her, though. I mean, I want to see her get saved. I think that would be a beautiful testimony. Her name's Tanya Franklin. We pray for her. She's on my prayer wall in my office. Doesn't mean I hate her. But you better believe I'm angry. Better believe I'm angry. There are thousands of preachers in this country that are teaching false gospels. You better believe I'm angry with them. They're leading people into hell. You better believe I'm mad. You ought to be mad. If you're a Christian, you ought to be mad about that. Don't mean I hate the people. Love to see them get saved. Love to see them turn around. <laughs> Shoot, I used to be one of those people. Here I am today, you know. I used to teach false grace. I was, by the definition, a false teacher. We have this idea today that we that that's being hypocritical. You used to be something like that, and now you're angry at those kind of people? Yeah, because I saw how it hurt people. First hand. I'm as angry about that, probably more angry with pharmaceutical companies that have just pushed drugs out into this land like they're just candy. And all you ought to be angry about that. I mean, I could sit up here all day on a soapbox and help you to see that you can be angry and be sanctified. You want a biblical proof? How about Jesus walking into a church, walking into a temple, took the tables and flipped them over, made a whip of cords, and, and whipped people <laughs> in that place until they got out. But, but Jesus did not sin. Not ever, not once. Anger in and of itself is not a sin. The way that anger gets directed can be a sin. You shed innocent blood because you're angry. When you hurt people that are innocent because you're angry, then you'll cross the sin. We can keep on going through these things. Wicked plans. People make wicked plans because they have wicked past habits. And whenever you want to get past the habit, you've got to make a plan. You can't just like say, well, I came to the altar and I gave that to Jesus. I've seen people try to get over their addictions and things like that over and over and over. Well, they just keep coming to the altars and they keep falling into it. Why? They don't have a plan. They go right back to the same thing they were doing in the same area and the same friends. They just, and before you know it, they're devising wicked plans. I mean, just keep on going. Running to evil. Derived from pressure. Pressures of life. Somebody comes out of a particularly sinful area of their life um, and then whenever pressure strikes they run back to that pet sin whatever it may be whether if it's lust or drinking or whatever bearing a false witness and you know it's again lying sown discard uh, among people and you know I really don't know why people cause so much drama sometimes there are just those people that like to do that that will you know talk to one person and say hey you know you ought to hear what Bill said about you the other day. And they'll go to the other person and say, you ought to hear what Bill said about you the other day. And they just go back and forth and back and forth and get two people fighting with one another. People just blood drama like that. I don't know why people do that. But what I'm trying to make a distinction here in is there's a difference between your humanity and there's a difference in sin. Your humanity can lead to sin, but that does not mean that it's sinful. It does not mean that it's sinful. You can. The question, though, is when it comes to holiness, can you still be holy when your holiness is challenged? Can you still be holy when your holiness is challenged? Whenever you face temptation, will you run to sin or will you run to God? Temptation in and of itself is not sin. Everybody was tempted. Jesus was tempted. But whenever you're tempted, are you going to run to sin or are you going to run to God? That's all based upon how much you control your emotions. You've got to learn how to control your emotions. 
because your emotions, when they're not sanctified to God, they are going to run you over instead of you running over them. You have to learn how to do that. That's not something I believe Sister Sarah talked this about to me extensively. She's, you know, uh, talked about how she's trained her emotions. You have to do that. You have to train those emotions. You can't control your emotions. Your emotions are going to control you. You got to learn how to do that. You all don't take anything that I say the rest of the night. Take that one home. If you don't control your emotions, your emotions will control you, right? Amen. Quote that on Facebook, whatever. Just take that one to heart. <laughs> so, <clears throat> emotions are not a bad thing. If so, Jesus would have sinned whenever he wept over Jerusalem, Lazarus, and his persecutors. Emotions aren't a bad thing. But when they control you, they are. So you have to have those things sanctified. They're always going to be a part of you. Sanctification will determine on whether or not you respond to them or you let them respond to your convictions. I know that's a deep subject, but you know, that's where we're at. <laughs> we're going to move on with this. Because it is, uh, I, don't, I don't want to spend some time on this. Third, what did we see in our verse tonight? Jesus wants to sanctify our body. Our body. <clears throat> Jesus said in Mark chapter 14, verse 38, Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, as I said at the beginning of the sermon, there are two kinds of flesh. You've got to understand this to understand a lot of the scripture. Um, two kinds of flesh. What makes it extra confusing is they both come from the same basic Greek word, which is sars. But in, say for instance, Romans chapter 7, when Paul's talking about flesh, People have asked and argued for centuries, or is Paul talking about the physical body, or is he talking about a spiritual body, or the carnal nature? And the reality of it is, it could be physical body, or the flesh denotes, as it says in uh, Thayer's Greek lexicon, it could be the physical body, second definition would be, the flesh denotes mere human nature, the earthly nature, the part of a man from that the nature of man apart from divine influence. In other words, it is a nature that is carnal and therefore prone to sin and opposed to God. And that's most likely, I believe, what Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 7. It just makes sense. But we have to understand that our animal nature, our fleshly nature, our sinful nature, the thing that causes us to sin, also, we have a carnal nature and we have a human nature. We've got to separate those two things. Because there are things that we would think, because they can be attached to sin, are carnal, but they really are not. They're just part of being a natural human being. God will deal with the flesh that is sinful and give us grace to bring our desires underneath His control. That's what he wants to do. Carnality itself is found in the mind. And so God wants to sanctify that. And he wants to bring that under so that we can bring those desires under control. Um, John R. Church gave a practical definition of what carnality, what this flesh is. He said, carnality is a warp, a twist, a bent, or perversion of our mind, affection, and will. And God wants to change that in us. He wants to change that and turn that around to where we are not carnal people anymore, that he wants us to, he's going to help us to follow him, like we said earlier, love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So we're no longer in rebellion to God. And with carnality cleansed from the heart, the human aspects will no longer hold us down. So let's look at the human aspects of the flesh, and this is where we'll end tonight. There are a few human traits of the flesh, such as, but not being limited to by any means, Pain, for instance. Pain, sluggishness, weakness, nervousness, hunger, lack of coordination, reactions to fear, harshness of voice, fierceness of appearance, trembling in the presence of danger. And we're going to bring this sermon up to the PG-13 level. I hope everybody's ready for this. But even sexual desire. 
It is not necessarily a sinful desire. And people have got to wrap their head around that. Now there's a thin line. And this is important. This is important. And I hope this doesn't make anybody uncomfortable, but it's something that needs to be talked about. The goodness of the church, we're losing our kids to sexual immorality. They need to understand this thing. And believe me, the kids that are present here tonight, it's, I'm not going to admit, I'm going to say anything they don't already know anyway. I'm going to talk about it around the lunch table and watch it on TV, and it's everywhere in our culture. We have the most sexually driven culture I've ever seen. It is crazy. They said that the pornography industry now is a 10, I think it's a 10 billion dollar industry a year in the United States. I mean, you think about it. <clears throat> human traits, our physical bodies, what is part of our human nature. Guess what, guys? Women are always the one to be used. But I'm going to tell you something. That is one of the biggest struggles for anybody who is trying to follow Jesus that you've ever seen in your life. And I think it's for two reasons. The first reason is um, that many, many men in these days are trying to overcome lust issues. They're trying to overcome lust issues. And Jesus said that if you lust over a woman, you might as well commit an adultery in your heart, which puts you at a conundrum as a man, you're like, well, what do I do when I recognize that a woman is attractive? Is that not lust? And I will tell you shortly and simply, that is not lust. That is part of your human nature. Your human nature is, as a man and even as a woman, women, you are not exempt from this either. Women are always going to notice if a man is handsome and, and men are always going to notice if a woman is attractive. You're never going to stop doing it. It's just not going to happen. That is intrinsic to your human nature. Now what makes it a sin is when you take that too far with your mind. When you take that too far with your mind, you are committing sin. But a lot of people are walking around in the church today with false guilt and condemnation, thinking that they're living in a world of lust and they cannot ever overcome it just because they realize that a woman is pretty or not. It's true. It's true that that's part of your human nature. God will give you the grace to help you with that. God will give you the grace to overcome with the, some of the things that you may have introduced in your life as a sinner. He will give you grace to overcome those things. He'll make you any less of a Christian, especially people that were addicted to things like pornography and things like that. Um, you could be walking down the street and one of those images just pop in your head and pop back out. Like, what on earth was that about? I have thought about that being it's sad, but that's part of our human mind. Our mind is a very, it is a fancy little computer, pretty much. It stores things back in those memory banks, and you, kids especially, need to take heed to this. There's going to be a time when you will not, the things that you're putting in front of your eyes, you don't want them to be there, but they just show up, sometimes in the worst possible times. And I'll tell you this very transparently, you know, whenever I was a kid, and I've watched pornographic material and things like that. He's like 16, 17, 18 years old. There'll be times when I'm even preaching a sermon in one of those images of everybody. And I hate it. I love it. I'll be walking down the street, some of that filthy music that I used to play, I will get one of those songs stuck in my head, and it will not go away. And I hate it. I can't stand it. And when I was a young Christian, I used to think that that was because I was just this sinful, horrible person and then Satan would get on my back and he would constantly try to drag me down and steal my victory away. But then finally when I got, you know, eight years, seven or about six years down the line, I guess, in the Christian walk, I started to begin to realize that like, these things aren't going to go away overnight. And I found something out that the more I fill my mind with godly things, the less of those thoughts I have. I've come to altars and cried and wept with sincere saints and prayed over me. Oh, oh my goodness, I can't tell you. But the more I fill my mind with godly things, the less those things come into my mind. Boy, when I first became a Christian, it was like I was playing with it. I'd be sitting in church and I'd have so much false guilt walking around church. This is truly false guilt because that junk was on. 
This is part of your human nature. This is part of your body. This is part of who you are. Just because you wake up with pain in the morning and you don't feel like doing your devotions does not make you any less of a Christian. It doesn't make you sick. Your physical body is going to hold you back. And I say the older you get, the more it's going to hold you back. <clears throat> you just got to learn how to manage that and live on. I am not one of those people. If you ever hear me preach it, find another church that believes, I will never believe this, that the reason you aren't healed is because you don't have enough faith to be healed. I will never believe that. I will never buy that. That is absolutely ridiculous. <clears throat> You're going to have weakness. You're going to be nervous. You're going to have reactions to fear. One of the godliest men that I know, <laughs> Tom Morton, he, told, he tells a lot of his classes. I've heard him tell his story at least twice. He grew up in the streets of Chicago. He's, a teacher, he's one of our teachers at the Bible College. Grew up in the streets of Chicago. If somebody sneaks up behind you in the streets of Chicago, you're, you react quite a bit differently than the way somebody would sneak up behind you in, in the church in Eastern Kentucky, for instance, or in Iowa, I think, through this happened. He said uh, one of his church members snuck up behind him. He grabbed the guy by the arm, flipped him over his shoulder, and threw him down into the, in the lobby of his church. And he was the pastor of a holiness church, sanctified. You know? Was that a sin? No, it was, a, it was what you call a fight-or-flight reaction. That's part of your human nature. Sometimes we have those moments, especially as a young Christian, especially if you had a filthy mouth like I did, or you stub your toe or something like that, and a bad word just flies out of your mouth. It's not like you meant to do it. It just happens. God understands those weaknesses. God understands those weaknesses. He understands that you're a human being. He understands that you need to grow. He understands that that cuss word coming out of your mouth didn't come from a place in which you were rebelling against Him in your heart. It came out of a habit that you're trying to put away. You meant no ill will toward God. He understands that. And I'll go so far as saying that He don't even count that as a sin. He just doesn't. Because sin always comes from rebellion. Sin always comes from rebellion. It comes from the place of saying, I'm going to rebel against God and I'm going to say this word. But if it's out of habit, God understands that you're trying to put that habit away. That in and of itself is one of the most freeing things I've ever been taught to this Christian. Freeing thing. And people who say that sin and thought were need every day, I guarantee you, if they heard a sermon like this and understood this teaching, they could understand even themselves. They can overcome sin in their life. They can overcome every single willful action of rebellion against God in their life. And that's what God calls sin. Your humanity is not sin. Sin is always rebellion. It springs out of the carnal nature. And here's the glorious thing. The carnal nature is cleansed. There's no more sin to hold you down. So you can have that uh, sin as a rebellion taken out of your heart and walk clean and clear before Him. <clears throat> Somebody persecutes you. Somebody says something mean or evil about you. And you, and you say, well, the, the Bible says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. You, I need to rejoice. The Bible says I need to be rejoicing when I get persecuted. Why is that so hard for me to do? Because you're listening to your feelings and you're not letting your rejoicing be an act of the will. But you rejoice anyway, no matter how you feel. Sanctification deals with sin on those two levels. Sin as a nature, sin as a sin as a, an action. <clears throat> now, I'm going to give you guys a, a quick test, see how smart you guys are. Alright, which card is bigger than the other? Which card is bigger than the other? No? Can you see it from back there, Lori? Yes. Which one thinks bigger than the other? Red. 
Where is there a break? Anybody else want to try? Like, you mean like long ones? Yeah, which one's bigger? Oh, red. Red? Yeah, two red. Everybody else agree with red? Red? They're actually the same exact size. They're actually the same exact size. I say that because not everything is as you see it. Not everything is always as it seems. If I would have done this when I first started that illustration and said, now, which one's bigger than the other? Every single one of them would say, well, obviously, they're both the same size. But when you understand that both of these things are the same size, you already know the answer to that question, don't you? This is what we're doing here tonight. Is you've got to understand. When you understand that not every little thing that you're dealing with is simple, you can have total victory over sin. You can have total victory over sin. Not everything is always as it seems. The devil would try to say, you know, like I tricked you up here tonight, I was being the devil. I was asking you, you know, which one of these is bigger. I knew that they're both the same size. I was asking you a trick question. I already knew that. See, that's what the devil wants to do with our humanity and our sinfulness. He wants them both <clears throat> to look exactly the same so that he can keep our confidence down in the grace of God so that he can keep you tripped up in your sin. That's why this is so important. That's why it's so important. <clears throat> so closing with this verse, Hebrews chapter 4, 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. What that is saying there is Jesus took on humanity. When he came and was born and incarnated into this world, he came in the likeness of human flesh. He came in a physical body. He was tempted in all points like we were. He was like we are. He, he was tempted with lust. In every sin that has ever been on this earth, Jesus has been tempted with. He was tempted with stealing. Jesus was tempted with some of the, I mean, you take the craziest sin in your mind right now, you can think of, Jesus was tempted in that way. Some of the things that are going through my mind right now, I really don't even feel comfortable saying it. But it is true that he was tempted in all points like we are. But he didn't fall into sin. Jesus had a perfect understanding of humanity, weakness, and sin. And today, as he sits on his throne in heaven at the right hand of the Father, praying for me and you as saints, he understands your weakness, your infirmities, your human nature, and he understands your heart. That tonight, if you have no rebellion against him in your heart, then he understands that you are sanctified and all the grace of God abounds to you. All the grace of God abounds. But if there's rebellion in there, he understands that too. He's come to cleanse and sanctify you and make you clean and pure and holy before him. Isn't that good? Well, I hope you walk out of here tonight lighter than when you came in with a deeper understanding of how to walk in this victory. Walk in this victory. So don't let Satan try to hold you down in these areas. <clears throat> Say, listen, I've got no rebellion in my heart. That's what sanctification is all about. I've got no rebellion in my heart. And I'm just serving Jesus the best I can with this earthly best that he's given. As long as you're giving God your best, you're going to get God's best. You just keep on living. Keep on walking. He doesn't want to sing trust and obey. I thought, well, that's a good way to end it. Trust and obey. So, <clears throat> you may need some help with anything. The altars are open. You can come to God. Boy, you just need to thank you. If this truth really sets a fire underneath me, I'll be honest with you, it's a hard thing for me to preach and talk about. 437. But it's such a freeing thing to know and that be clear of what we understand of sin and our little weaknesses. So let's sing Trust and Obey. When we walk with the Lord
trust you and obey you. Help us to, to stick close to your word, close to your grace. Then help us, Lord, to seek that blessing. There's no rebellion in our heart. Nothing we're holding from you, Lord. Nothing we're holding back from you. But Lord, help us also to learn how to manage these human follies as we walk through life. And walk in victory and let it not hinder our confidence in God and confidence in your grace as we continue to move forward in the grace of God and grow consistently and constantly. Lord, until we have that glorified body with no more weakness, no more infirmities, no more, nothing holding us back, Lord. Lord, I'm just so thankful that you want to redeem us wholly and completely. So we're thankful, Lord, that, that the grace of God is there, the mercy of God is there, understanding is there, and a God that's full of compassion and love toward us is there to help us in every need. We don't go through anything you didn't go through on the earth, Lord. You went through so much more for us. Help us to walk in that confidence as we leave this place. In Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Sorry I kept you a little bit late tonight. But I have fun. <laughs>